radio tracer does. This is an imaging radio tracer that images bone metabolism. This is a drug that may have effects in the bone. And actually, remember I talked about how bone scans can get healing flares when the cancer cells die and the bone scan can potentially look worse. We think that this is probably picking up a very sensitive a mechanism of healing flares. The one thing that I think that this emphasizes is that there's heterogeneity. Remember I talked about that that not every cancer in every bone is created equal. And this is a patient who did intermediately well in the study. And it looks like that he had a very nice response <clears throat> by imaging here to the treatment. But again, most of the sites got better, but this one site here got worse. What does that mean in a patient? We don't truly know. And what we'd like to do is to understand that. Could we use PET imaging to metabolically detect a tumor that's getting worse to help us study mechanisms of drug resistance. We're trying to understand what's happening in the exact tumor when it's not responding to any drug we give, whether it's any new drug, there's drugs like abiraterone, there's chemotherapies, et cetera. And what we want to do is we want to do PET imaging before and after and do tumor biopsies in the lesions that look like they might be getting better, in the lesions that look like they might be getting worse. We want to take those imaging modalities and see Based on the response on imaging, does this correlate with long-term outcomes? And we want a biopsy to understand what's happening biologically in the tumor that looks like it's getting better versus look like it's getting worse on the PET imaging. This again, I just want to show this one slide about a study that we're just getting ready to start doing. Cavalzatinib is a drug that many of you may have heard of. It's a pretty novel drug. It has effects on tumor blood vessel growth and development and on a protein called CMET and it's created some very interesting results on imaging. These are standard bone scans where things look like they disappear. Pain gets better, but PSA doesn't seem to change very well. What's happening there? Well, we want to combine our tumor biopsies and imaging with both fluoride and acetate again to do it before and after treatment to understand what's actually happening in the tumors there. So just to wrap up, to summarize, when an elevation of PSA occurs as biochemical recurrence, it's actually microscopic metastatic prostate cancer. We might not be able to see it with our standard imaging yet, but with better imaging, we might be able to identify the location. Choline's probably the best for finding the lymph nodes. Fluoride's probably the best for finding the bone metastases. And its PET imaging may be especially useful in determining response to therapy, exploring tumor and drug bio bio uh, biology, selecting tumors to biopsy. <clears throat> it also can identify heterogeneity of prostate cancer and may help study mechanisms of drug resistance. Thank you very much. <laughs> and a fellow, George Ramos, who's working me, with me on many of these projects. Thanks. Great. So I'd like to invite all four speakers to come up uh, to the front of the room. We'll turn the lights on and then we'll open it up for about 15 minutes of uh, Q&A. Um, it'd be great if you could use a microphone so you could uh, flag NOLA down or we'll ask one of the speakers to repeat the question. Pretty wide-ranging uh, series of topics. Um, again, we've got about 15 minutes, so uh, why don't we go? We'll start in the front of the room right here. I have two questions, one for Dr. Right, you said statins lower PSA. You said statins lower PSA. I wasn't clear though whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, yes, yeah, so statins do lower PSAs. Um, the effect for lowering PSAs doesn't, doesn't mean it's having any effect on the prostate cancer, but it may be lowering the PSA so that we're not going to, that person may not be uh, recommended for talking to a urologist about having a biopsy, whether or not that should be done. So it may be masking it. It may be masking it, yes. Thank it's you. It's interesting because there's a lot of, but there's also a lot of interest in do statin medications have an effect on cancer as well. And that's one of the things that's also being looked at. And so it could both mask it and be better for it. Okay. It's a complicated. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we're nowhere on that just yet. <laughs> Dr. Stan. <Welcome> research. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Stanford, um, you, your talk was on genetic testing. If a person like myself, not associated with any particular clinical trial and so forth, wants to get genetic testing, do you have any recommendations for firms that do a good job of analyzing the test? Well, I think where we are today, I, I think those common genetic variants are not useful uh, in terms of measuring risk in men. Um, 
because they're not associated with high risk and um, it's going to be very hard to apply those for genetic testing. However, the, um, <clears throat> the genes that I showed that have rare mutations, um, I also don't think any individual one of those is currently being offered, um, although there is a lot of interest and there's a study going on right now called the IMPACT study that's looking at BRCA2 testing. Uh, and biopsy in men that carry the BRCA2 mutations versus men who don't carry those mutations to see if knowing, of your, knowing about your mutation status would actually help in finding uh, or if that would actually be an indicator for someone who's got a higher risk for um, prostate cancer detection. Um, but at the moment, they're, they're really not offering um, genetic testing for any of those rare high-risk mutations. I think what we're going to come down to as we find additional genes with mutations that contribute to um, high risk of prostate cancer, I think it's probably going to be most efficient if, if there's a development of a panel of those markers that could be tested for. So you're not just tested for one, but maybe it's going to be a dozen of those. I heard the name Prolaris, the company that's doing testing. Are they testing for something other than what you were talking about? Um, <clears throat> Jonathan may want to talk about the Polaris test because it is being used um, somewhat, but um, that's not really related uh, to what I'm talking about today, so it's not um, risk-associated genetic mutations. What are they looking for? Um, they're looking at, at, instead of genetic things that you're born with, they're looking at changes that happen uh, in the tumor, what's going on in the tumor tissue itself, and, and using that for trying to decide uh, aggressiveness of the prostate cancer, should you be treated or not, is your... So, it's so we're, we're going to have to keep going further, but... You will hear about it later in the day. Too. Yeah, so the next one here. Uh, yes, my, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is from uh, for Dr. Neuhauser. Uh, does physical activity promote uh, serotonin? Does it promote serotonin? I don't know of any research showing that physical activity promotes serotonin. Okay. Uh, my second question was from Dr. Yu. Is uh, C. colon imaging uh, done in Seattle area or only in the Mayo Clinic, does it? Right, and the, it's done in, in Europe, and the Mayo Clinic right now has uh, rights to be able to do it. So the FDA gave them approval right now and approval only. There is potentially co-licensing with them, and that may be something that we want to explore down the road. Uh, but right now, it's in the United States. It's just at the Mayo Clinic. Thank you. And may I ask my third question, too, we'll quickly? Others, and then you can okay, come back fine. Just speak loudly, and then we'll have them repeat the question. Okay, uh, two questions. Uh, could you comment on the state of the art of targeted biopsying in the Northwest, especially the fusion technique with pestle-free machines? And the second question, could you comment on uh, Dr. Dean Orange's work with diet for low-grade prostate cancer? I think I'll take the first question. Um, uh, in terms of three Tesla. Um, oh, you're talking about the prostate, is that right? Prostate biopsies. <laughs> I'll let Jonathan take that question. Yeah, so we, so, uh, we are using uh, MRI. It's an MRI technique to try to identify lesions in the prostate. We are uh, not using it widespread for everyone that comes in with a P elevated PSA. We are using it, one, in the active surveillance population to follow to see if there's a, a lesion to detect that we can target. And secondly, uh, uh, some of us are using it, I'm using it in the setting of a prior negative biopsy if, the P if there's indications for biopsy being elevated, rising PSA, PCA3, I'll use that to try to target it. Um, and it's, this is something that's really come up out over, even just over the last year that's become more readily used and we are using it too and are in the process of getting the fusion technology where it takes the MRI and fuses it with the real-time ultrasound that we're, that we're doing. Dean Ornish's work is great and uh, uh, it's exciting what he's doing with, uh, with lifestyle and, uh, and prostate cancer. So we're just going to keep working our way back. The next one's here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is this okay? I want to make sure. I usually talk so loud that I don't need one of these. So um, anyway, the question may seem silly, but I noticed on a lot of CT scans, any type of scans, there's coloration. Is this artificially induced after, or or is it done by imaging that it highlights things that? 
that send out a big different signal, or is it artificial? So in most CT scans, there is not coloration. That was fused with PET imaging. That's why there was coloration there. Again, please. What, I'm with most CT scans, there isn't coloration, actually. It was fused with PET imaging. That's why there was coloration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Keep going back. The next one, way over here. Just yell out, just speak loudly and we'll repeat yeah, the question. I, I talk pretty loud anyway. My, my question, I've been, uh, I've had, uh, my TSA was going up real fast uh, for the last two years. It started at 0.7, that was my normal, then it went up, and my doctor sent me to a urologist, and he had 12, 12 biopsies, saw no cancer, but then two precancer scrolls. Then it went up higher, so he called me back, and I had another 12 biopsies, same thing. Never been seen. Then I, uh, I ended up, I had to go to a different neurologist so I change business. But anyway, uh, now he, I have been diagnosed with uh, metastatic cancer after my PSA is up to over 45. Would I be, I would ask Dr. Yu, would I be a, a good candidate for this, uh, uh, this, uh, this is called test, uh, test CT? Yeah, I think that um, you potentially could be. We certainly did have a trial a while back where we were imaging hormone-sensitive patients, and I think that with lipid me metabolic modalities like choline and acetate, that it can detect that very well and detect changes in response to therapy. I will just say, though, that probably the usefulness for metastatic disease is best going to be for when the disease is resistant to the hormones. And the reason why is, is that when it's sensitive to hormonal therapy, the PSA is going to decline, the imaging is going to look pretty stable, and we feel pretty confident that we can use PSA in that setting. When the disease becomes more resistant to hormonal therapy and the PSA starts to rise, that's when there's a lot of questions that arise with our new drugs and new drug development, et cetera. So where you're at right now, I would say I'm not so sure you, it's going to be add that much to what is in the armamentarium already, but somewhere down the road, definitely. <laughs> right. Right. Right, I, I'm guessing that it's responding well. I mean, universally, just about everyone responds to Lupron. So, so I've, I've got a card question, and then we'll get to the person here in the back. And this is probably either for Jonathan or Marion. Is belly fat in a normal weighted person nevertheless an indication of elevated risk for prostate cancer? Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of interest in uh, belly fat, or also called visceral fat. Is it more biologically active uh, than the fat underneath our skin, subcutaneous fat. That's an area of active research, uh, and one of the things that we're trying to do is identify what is it about that uh, belly fat, that visceral fat that is more active or is more cancer promoting. There's even a fat that sits right in front of the prostate uh, that is visceral uh, belly fat, and, and, and there's evidence that it may be interacting and talking with the prostate itself and the prostate cancers. There's also a lot of people will use waist circumference as opposed to BMI, and I, I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleague to comment on that. Yeah, Dr. Wright made some very good points. I think the one point I will add is that there are a lot of products on the market and a lot of popular literature that talks about targeting belly fat. If you use this product, this dietary supplement, it will get rid of your belly fat. Those claims are not substantiated by research. You can't really uh, spot reduce um, in, in spite of what some products tell you. So if you have an overall weight reduction program, exercise program, that will help you to reduce your waist circumference and the so-called belly fat, but there are no magic pills that can uh, automatically get rid of the so-called belly fat. Was there a question in the back here somewhere? Got it, okay. How about uh, right here? To the imaging guy, uh, I have several books on this subject, and uh, they show rather nice pictures that were taken with ultrasonics. And uh, it seems to me that the sensor is so much closer. You're putting this thing in the rectum, and uh, why would you use a CT scan? Uh, that's a dangerous technique and expensive and remote from the, I mean, the machine is remote from the organ. 
Um, a CT scan will give you better definition and you know of of the tumor than an ultrasound will. It will. I mean, there are different modalities. When ultrasound uses sound waves, so and they use ultrasounds very regularly in the clinic to do biopsies, uh, and it can certainly identify the tumors. But again, I mean. <clears throat> Again, most of my talk was not focused on identifying the prostate cancer in the prostate. It was identifying the cancer in the lymph nodes and the bones. So again, those would certainly be advantageous with CT bone scan PET imaging. Just an editorial comment about picking up the cancer in the prostate. It has been extraordinarily difficult to have any imaging that can identify prostate cancer within the prostate. It's clearly where the whole field is trying to go. But prostate cancer, unlike most of the other cancers we deal with, is very infiltrative. It doesn't form usually a nice discrete mass like you can see in lung or breast cancer. So the, you know, there are new techniques coming along, but it's still not um, uh, you know, a, certainly a tried and true method, importantly of picking up even high grade cancer, which are the ones that we want to treat. Um, is there a question here? Yes. Yeah. This is for Dr. Can Stone. you use the mic? Just speak right into it. You just, there you go. Oh, okay. You're that safe. way. <laughs> uh, this question is for Dr. Stanford. Uh, you mentioned that 42% prostate cancer is 42% hereditary. Uh, my husband's mother, unfortunately, passed away of breast cancer, and then he came down with prostate cancer. Now, we have two sons. I have two questions. Can they, he didn't have it, but can they have it? They might, should they be tested if they carry the gene? First one. Well, so at the, at the moment, we're not really doing genetic testing, but, it, uh, but I think we will be within the next five years it's coming. Okay. It's on the horizon. So there may be something to offer them, and certainly what we know from our family studies is that these high-risk mutations can be passed either through the mother's side of the family or from the father's side of the family. Okay. And then at what age should they have the PSA test? Well, currently, um, family history, as Dr. Wright mentioned, is one of the main indications for starting PSA testing earlier and keeping a closer watch on men who have a strong first-degree family history of the disease. So really, uh, age-wise, um, by 40, I think, uh, certainly by 45, they would want to have a baseline PSA. Okay. This Thank might you. be a nice uh, situation. So again, I mentioned we will be opening this prevention clinic um, that can help counsel families and really do a detailed pedigree to see if some particular type of genetic testing might be useful or at least to guide counseling for when PSA screening or other screening might be useful. So again, stay tuned. In the next uh, several months, it should be open and um, this would be a... Right a, here at SCC At, the univer at uh, Roosevelt Clinic at the University Roosevelt. of Washington. Okay, we'll you mentioned that. that before mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Yes. So stay tuned for that. Question here? Yeah. Will the slide deck be made available for download later? The w oh, the slides? We can probably do that. They will be all on YouTube again, so you'll be able to download those and look at them all as, as well. We've got a question from the uh, written comment, and then Jim will follow up here. So this is related to another family history question. So uh, Dr. Stanford, if a mother had lymphoma, does this increase the likelihood of a son developing prostate cancer? So a lymphoma prostate cancer connection. Right, so um, there are some prostate connections with other cancers, as I mentioned, breast cancer, but there's no, um, at this point in time, there's no research showing that lymphoma is associated with prostate cancer. Yeah, Jim? Uh, you mentioned 40% uh, of the prostate cancer is hereditary, this mutation. Are they studying the other 60% of men who don't have that genetic profile, but they become a mutated cell uh, like those of us who don't have a family history? Is there a way to look for that, how those cells become mutated, and then a way to stop that mutation? Well, so what I'm talking about is um, genetic uh, factors that you inherit at birth in your DNA. I think in terms of the somatic changes, the, the changes that occur in the prostate, the beginning of the tumor development, um, 
right now you're going to hear some about that this afternoon with sequencing of the tumors that are there and looking for mutations that may be related to um, the development of prostate cancer, looking at the tumor tissue. Um, Great. So a question in the back here, and then we'll go right here. You can just speak loudly and we'll... Oh, I, I talk loud. I've got three boys. I'm not sure where I should direct them, so I'll just kind of push it out there. I've got three boys, 53, 52, and 50, um, who here I am with prostate cancer. I have other cancers. I have prostate cancer. I've got stitches about. Um, their medical doesn't even allow them to go for a prostate cancer check. They said it's not in the I have two questions. That's one of two. Maybe Jonathan or as far as screening goes, can you repeat the question because uh, So I think the question was you have three sons. Yeah. You you're a prostate cancer survivor. You have three sons that are in their fifties. Yeah. Um, and and you want to know if they should have the PSA test for screening. And I would say yes, that's one of the high risk groups based on your your having the disease. We know their risk has increased two to three fold. And so they would be individuals that if they're local, um, perhaps they can come to the, the newly um, opening prevention clinic and have a check and a PSA test done. They're well, yeah, I mean, we're lucky in Washington State that we actually have a, have a, a law in the books that hopefully we'll be able to maintain it, but a lot of it was passed by, uh, by urologists' work in the past couple of decades, in the past 10 years of you, the insurance has to cover a PSA in our state here. So this is what we're going to be coming down. We're going to hear more stories like, like about your sons. Um, but uh, again, this is why we're developing this, this, uh, this prostate uh, this, this clinic because you will not be an uncommon story. I mean, luckily a PSA test itself is not particularly expensive. I don't know what the current rate is, but it might be useful even if insurance doesn't cover it to get a baseline test. Second quick question. Okay, I have other cancers, which, which I found out after going into the cancer clinic I'll address that one. Yeah, so um, the thing we have to realize is that many of, so to repeat the question, you've been diagnosed with several other malignancies, blood blood related uh, cancers, and the question is, is, is there a relationship with prostate cancer? So the thing we have to realize that almost all the cancers we deal with are related to aging. As we get older, we have more mutations that occur that aren't corrected by the systems that our body has to fix those changes. So many cancers we deal with are simply, simply due to mutations that accumulate and um, by bad luck, we start hitting cancer predispos predisposition genes. So we don't know of any relationship clearly to blood cancers and prostate cancer other than a clear association with advancing age. Unfortunately, yeah. So, question here. Uh, this question is for uh, Dr. Stanford. Uh, my wife just a while ago mentioned that uh, my mother had breast cancer, which eventually uh, went to her lung and then to her brain, which killed her within a span of 11 years. Now, I'm one of those fortunate men who can get breast cancer as well as prostate cancer. My breast cancer was in 1996, prostate cancer 2012. Uh, my BRCA2 mutation test showed negative. So, uh, two questions. What are the chances of me getting lung and brain cancer? And second, you have already answered my wife, which is about our sons when they should screen for uh, prostate cancer or a PSA test. So, I think that question is very difficult to answer. 
because I think we don't know what the probability is that you'll develop additional cancers. Um, I don't think we know based on the information that we have now in terms of secondary and you know, additional primary cancers in men who've had prostate cancer, but certainly, um, as Dr. Nelson mentioned, as you age, you're more likely or more vulnerable to having additional cancers develop uh, for multiple different reasons. But, you know, I don't, from the studies that we've done in our, can in our prostate cancer families, we haven't really seen an excess of lung cancer, for example, but I can't tell you that the risk is zero. But this is an important issue. So what is starting to uh, be recognized is that in breast cancers, even in women in families with, uh, with breast cancer, it's not just BRCA1 and BRCA2. There are many other genes involved in repairing DNA damage. So Mary Claire King at the University of Washington has developed a panel to understand other mutations or alterations in hereditary uh, these DNA repair genes. So I would suggest that you see a genetic counselor and think about this other test because this association might be very fundamental. Not that you're necessarily at risk for other cancers, but understanding the root cause that might be important for other family members. So we're going to, sorry, we're going to, you can come down and grab these individuals. We need to take our break. So please use the bathroom, get your coffee, come back in 10 minutes for the next session and track these folks down here. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you.